All right. Hi, everyone. My name is Katrina Kibben, and I'm the Managing Editor for Recruiting Daily. Thank you for joining our Talent Mobility webinar today, Why Talent Mobility is King of Retention, sponsored by our friends over at Rollpoint. All right, you're taking a look at our title slide. We promise to jump right in soon. But before we get started, let's go over the agenda and then I have a few tips on using GoToWebinar uh, to make sure that the technology is working with you. Uh, so our agenda today, obviously we're gonna go through the housekeeping, uh, talk, give a big shout out to our sponsor, Rollpoint, uh, introduce our speaker, and then go through these specific elements of talent mobility to make sure that uh, you are leaving today with a lot of actionable advice and data that you can use in your practice. All right, so in the next slide, we have an image of our GoToWebinar panel, which I'm sure you've seen since it is up on your screen right now. I know I'm like the flight attendant of recruiting, trying to tell people how to use GoToWebinar, uh, but trust me, these are two important things to know. The first thing is audio. So by default, you've joined using your mic and speakers. If you hear any jumpiness uh, or it sounds like a robot is speaking to you, that's not Ben, that's you. So click on use telephone and that will give you all the dial-in information that you need. The second thing you need to know is how to use our Q&A set area. Uh, so there is a pane that's labeled questions. If you type in your questions there, we'll get them in the order uh, that you submit them so that we can ask Ben if it's particularly relevant to a slide, he's given me permission to uh, interrupt. And if not, I will keep them to the end. Again, submitting your question in order means that people, you'll get your question answered first. If there are questions that we can't get to, I'll make sure that they get to Ben and we'll make sure that all of your questions get answered. And don't worry if you can't stay until the Q&A, we are recording this and we will send you a copy of the recording within 48 hours. Last thing, again, a huge shout out to our sponsor, Rollpoint, who made this webinar possible. And if you're on Twitter, you can follow the conversation by following at Recruiting Blogs, which you can see at the bottom of that slide, or hashtag RDaily. Now I'm going to hand it over to Ben so he can tell you a little bit about you and we can get started talking about talent mobility. Awesome. Thanks, Katrina. Hey, everybody. My name's Ben Eubanks. I'm a principal analyst at Lighthouse Research and Advisory, and I'm just, I was telling Katrina before we got started, I'm excited to kind of talk through this today. It'll be a lot of fun. Uh, we'll, we'll get into some good stories of companies that are doing this well, because that's always fun to kind of dig into those. But just to give you a little bit about me, um, I've been in HR recruiting for, for several years now. Love talking about it, love writing about it, love doing it. Um, have been an in the trenches practitioner before I became an analyst, which is, again, a lot of fun. I was telling Katrina as well. I'm about. We're we're waiting on a call any day now uh, for the for the baby to be born. Um, waiting and excited about that. Hopefully, my wife can hold off for the next hour so we can get get through this together. But um, just another uh, fun thing as far as uh, dislikes celebrities jegging seafood and snark for the sake of it, um, which is kind of a shout out to my good friend Matt Charney. All right, so let's jump in and start talking about talent mobility. So. One of the things that's been kind of top of mind for me lately is this idea of building, buying, or borrowing the talent that we need. For a long time, the idea was we could either build them from within, we could buy them from externally, but I think this idea of being able to borrow our talent from other areas of the business, um, whether it's a, a short-term thing, a long-term assignment, or it could be a permanent position, I think that's really catching on in businesses today because they're starting to understand that the decisions they're making around their talent are more... Uh, discrete, granular, and they have more control over those things. So talent ability in general is a talent practice of using that employee talent where it's needed in conjunction with where the employee wants to go. So when you think about things like succession, it's only focused on what the business usually sees. You know, someone top down kind of makes a, makes a decision and, and says this is what we want. It doesn't take into account as to what the employee really wants. So I think this is really powerful as a recruiting practice and we're going to dig into some of those specific aspects of it today. So really, it's talent mobility is recruiting gold. So number one, think about it. If you could recruit from inside the organization versus having to go outside, that's incredibly powerful. 
the number one thing that employees, or sorry, that millennials are demanding in terms of their careers are career development opportunities. They want to grow. So it's easier to pull people in when we are telling them, hey, we have this talent mobility program. We're focused on this growing from within. Again, I'll give you some stories of companies that are doing that in a little bit. But it's also, on the flip side, easier to retain people once they're in and we have the ability to move them inside the organization, whether you have a hand in that or that's someone on the HR team, it doesn't matter. The good thing is that there should be hopefully less recruiting to fill those kind of slots and maybe you get more time for golf or whatever the heck you like to do. Not a golfer here, thank goodness. Let's talk about a couple of trends, kind of bigger picture talent trends I think that are feeding into this and giving, giving some life to this idea of, ta of talent mobility. So first up, when we think about career paths, for a long time, you know, we've heard the story of, you know, I, I got a job, I worked 30 years, I got my gold watch, yada, yada, yada. We hear that all the time. I think also one of those things that was very common then was there was a very structured career path. Someone started out as an apprentice, they became, you know, whatever's after an apprentice, and then they became a journeyman, you know, if you think about like a plumber or an electrician. People just had this very linear, straight career path today that doesn't necessarily go in a straight line. There could be a lot of twists, turns, leapfrogging, you know, jumping into other, other areas of the business, and I think that's valuable. That's, that's a good thing. That's not a bad thing, and that career path kind of changes driving this. Another piece that's tied into that is people want that control. They want to be able to to manage their own career, they want to manage their own work. Thinking about this idea of the gig economy, workers are taking on these these additional tasks outside their day job because they want that challenge, they want the money, they want you know some satisfaction from that, they want to be able to control the direction of their own destiny. And I think those things are figuring into this. What the idea of I'll talk about in a minute how World Banker created this internal talent marketplace, which is basically their own internal gig economy, where people could where people could find other jobs, find other projects, things to work on without having to leave the organization. And it's almost like they had their own eBay for talent where they were able to, to do these things all within the walls of the company and then have to leave there and uh, take away from their main job. And honestly, you know what, I still help some companies do some recruiting here locally in Huntsville where I live and I'm seeing that it's getting more and more difficult for some of these companies to hire these high reformers in some of the industries we're recruiting in, technical jobs, cybersecurity, those kind of things. It's just really difficult. And how much more valuable is it if we can get people to do those things inside the business, grow them, develop them, use those resources we have instead of trying to go out there and find them and move them from somewhere where it might be, they might be stuck. And then finally, when I uh, presented on the topic of the gig economy at HR Tech a couple weeks ago, I talked about disengagement statistics and throw up a fake stat about how disengagement is like 280%. Just as a way to shock people a little bit and think about, we hear these stats from Gallup and other organizations about how little we, <laughs> engagement we have in the workplace, but it's we've become almost immune to it and we, we just stopped listening to it, we stopped caring, but it should matter. And I think the fact that people are disengaged is an opportunity for a practice like talent ability to really breathe some life into that and add some value. All right, we're going to jump into some research now. And this is going to kind of run the gamut. There's a, there's a wide span of it, but we're going to be funneling in towards the practice of talent mobility. And we're going to look at some of these, these different organizations and how they've looked at this and, and dug into it. So before we get into to the uh, professional organizations you're all very familiar with, I have a pet hypothesis. This idea that millennials, we've been told, okay, think about how many times you've heard it this week probably, millennials want development opportunities from their business. I mentioned a minute ago even from a study I had seen, but we hear this all the time. People want development, but I wonder if it's the chicken or the egg. Do they want development because they truly want it, or do they want it because it's what's been sold in the hiring process? How many times during an interview have you told someone, hey, you know what, we train our people, we develop them, we grow them, and then people start with that with, with that sort of expectation. We, they think that's what we're going to give them, and then they're disappointed when we don't. So again, it's just my own personal pet hypothesis about this. I don't know which one's the chicken or the egg, but it's an interesting question, and it's one that I think everybody should take a moment to reflect on that and think about your business and how you approach people and what you tell them because if you talk about those aspects of development and how those opportunities are available and then they show up in their the reality is it's a little different there might not be as many opportunities as you've, you've talked about 
I think that is very telling. Okay. So, someone a little more professional. Let's see Glassdoor. Glassdoor, their recent research from earlier this year, 2016. 89% of their users are either actively looking for jobs or they would consider a better opportunity if one came along. Again, thinking about talent mobility and looking at it through that lens, a lot of people want to find other positions. Are those positions going to be outside the company or internal? Gallup's research said that 93% of employees, sorry, workers that took a new job, they did that outside the company. So the flip side of that, only 7% of workers that took a new job did so within their own firm. They were able to grow into another role or move laterally or something within their own company, staying within those walls. And that's kind of, there's a different stat that I'm going to use in a minute that shows a different angle of that. But again, just, just think about how small that is in general and, and uh, how much of an opportunity that presents in terms of using talent ability as a practice to keep those people inside the company. Even if it wasn't you know, 50%, even if it was only 20%, that's still much higher than the numbers are today. Okay, their, their research also shows that, again, this probably won't be a surprise for anybody, but the real reason people are looking to leave is they want to expand on their knowledge and they want to use their strengths. I had a manager years ago, her name was Christine, and goodness, every time I think about her, I get like warm fuzzies in my heart because she was the best manager I've ever had, and it's because she focused really heavily on my development. She asked me a lot of uncomfortable questions, like, what do you like? What do you want to do more of? And again, some people would wish their manager would say those things, but for me, it was hard. I wasn't sure what I wanted to commit to. I wasn't sure, you know, hey, I might be good at this, but is it what I want to do for a long period of time and, and grow in that area? Is that my, what I want to specialize in and be known for? And the good thing about her practice is she really focused on letting me use my strengths and move towards those things. She tried to remove those, those areas that I might not have been as good in or didn't love as much. But again, people are looking for that chance. She's, she's one in a million in terms of manager because most managers are not that mature. They don't have regular career conversations with their people and give them, they don't have a culture within the organization that really encourages people to speak up. And again, we'll give a story in a minute about how uh, Tata Consultancy Services does that within their own firm, massive organization, and how they're able to make that kind of work. Right, moving on. So I4CP. They, had, they did a study earlier this year specifically around talent mobility, and one of their findings was that managers who try to hold on their talent, ultimately that's bad for the business. And when you think about that logically, it makes sense. If you have an employee that wants to grow, wants to move into another role, and the manager is clinging tightly to them, then that's going to cost them. Uh, I have a good friend. She wanted to take a year off when she was about to have a baby and the manager really pressured her to not take the year off, just take the you know six weeks after the baby was born, and she grudgingly accepted, but after that year was over, after, after she came back from maternity leave for a short period of time, she actually quit and left because of that, that practice. You know, that's, not, that's just an, an example, but I think that, side, that sort of hoarding, that sort of managers trying to control that talent and keep it to themselves, I should have put the, the goal and picture here, you know, my precious, because they're trying to control the people, don't give them any sort of free will to say what they want to do, and then ultimately the people end up leaving because it's a frustrating, it's a challenge for them. One of the other pieces from the I4CP research I thought was really interesting is that not just good organizations, but high-performing organizations are more than twice as likely to prioritize this movement. Their low-performing organizations are more likely to say that talent movement doesn't matter. I think, again, that's a good, good way to stop and just think about your own organization, your culture, the way you see people. The, the term that I use normally to talk about talent is do you see your people as appreciating assets that are growing and developing for the better of the business, or do you see them as resources to be managed? You know, put your thumb on it, try to control it, try to you know, manage where it is every minute of every day, because that, that sort of mindset that you have is going to direct whether you're successful in this sort of approach or not. That's ultimately going to drive that. Moving on, Deloitte says that, again, high-performing companies have this set of processes in place which enable them to pursue this mobility very rapidly and effectively. And the thing that I like about their approach 
no statistic attached to this one, unfortunately, but the thing I like about their approach is they talk about it not in terms of an HR or recruiting or a talent problem, which is what we usually get when we read reports and things like this, or when you listen to a webinar like this, you, you hear about HR and talent problems. They talk about it from the perspective of the business. They said, as a business, we're going to be able to organizationally adapt. We're going to be more nimble, more agile. We'll be able to respond to challenges better, faster than we could if we were purely looking at this just as, you know, again, a static picture of our talent. I actually heard a podcast the other day with, uh, they were interviewing Dan Ariely, who is my favorite behavioral scientist. He's done some really great work. If you've never heard his TED talk on how we are very irrational as people and we make decisions that sometimes logically make no sense. Uh, it's a really, really great guy to listen to, but his, he's done some research and he said that people are twice as productive, not just a little bit more productive, but two times as productive when they feel their work has meaning beyond the task at hand. And the way that ties in with this talent ability concept is when we see the bigger picture, when we have the ability to understand our work in the context of the greater organization or the greater mission, the greater meaning, there's more value there. And again, there's more value for the person. They're happier. They're more engaged, if we want to use that term. They're more satisfied. And heck, the business is probably happier too if people are twice as productive. Okay, We'd love to get that kind of productivity out of our people. So keep that on our mind as well. You get a role point. So I got to hear role point um, presenting at the HR technology conference uh, last month, and they talked about they're kind of giving an overview of their solution, talking about it. And when I was preparing for this, I remember we had I kind of got a stat from them where they said that the large companies that they're working with over 45% of roles, nearly half, are filled by internal mobility. And I think that's a really interesting point to juxtapose against the Gallup data we saw a minute ago, which said that only 7% of roles are fueled by that internal ability. I don't know. Again, it's hard to, ex to explain the difference without seeing all the data and being able to dig into it, but I think that, that that gives us an idea that it doesn't matter if you're a large company, if you're a small company, you have the ability to do this. The, the first story that popped in my head when I started thinking about the idea of talent ability and, and how to cover that. Years ago, I worked as the HR director for a startup company, grew it from you know, 40, 50 employees all the way up to over 100, and the, we had an employee there who worked as a software engineer. Her name was Tina. I'll call her out. She's a good friend. Tina got a degree in software engineering, got this job right after college, worked as a software engineer, was really good at it, and hated it did not want to be an engineer. She did not have the engineer mindset, mentality. She just didn't want to be, do that for her whole life. And so very early on, she started asking questions of her manager who was pretty uncomfortable with it. He was an engineer too, and he didn't want to have those conversations with her. So he pushed her off to his boss, who was the vice president of engineering, and he had more of a uh, global look on the company and, and how the businesses were going go, and what sort of opportunities were there. And said, you know, what do you want to do? She said, you know what, I really want to be a manager. I want to be a program manager like you. I don't want to be an engineer. I don't want to be a senior engineer. I don't want to manage engineers necessarily. I want to be a program manager, a business person. And he said, you know, we're, we're a small company. We have 40, 50 employees, and we don't have the ability to move you there. But if you want to go in that direction, we'll support your you taking courses, we'll support you in your you know, interests and things, we'll support some flex assignments. And ultimately, today, she is a program manager, but because she had that unique background as a technical person, she's a technical program manager. So she can flex and have conversations that a typical PM couldn't because they can. she can speak and code and talk about the, the tech underlying the product. But she also has the ability to talk about the business aspects, the project deadlines, the, the deliverables, those kind of things that someone that's purely technical wouldn't be able to really have a good handle on. So it's a neat example of how someone was able to do that. And again, the company, when she finally moved into that role, was just under 100, 100 employees. So it doesn't require 10,000 people to be able to find opportunities like that to grow someone, develop them into this unique, valuable asset for the business to take advantage of. However, saying all that, I know that this is a very common story. So I found a, an interesting story about talent mobility the other day. I was reading through some of the comments, and 
unlike YouTube where the comments make you feel ter terrible at humanity, usually the comments on LinkedIn articles are pretty good. There's some good discussion. And the comment here from Joe, who I have no idea who he is, just uh, luckily got uh, lucky pick of the draw. But he said, you know, these ideas about talent and ability sound great, but companies aren't willing to invest in their employees. If you want to progress, you have to leave. And that's not going to sound surprising to any of us, I don't think. That's a very common kind of statement. I've had employees tell me that to my face. I've told managers that about their own employees, saying if you don't do this, they're going to leave because you are giving them no other option. So this is something that all of us kind of know, and we're, we're very you know, aware of that. But most people just aren't willing to take take a chance to change, to focus on that. And again, you'll see here, he's not an HR person. He's an analyst, whatever the heck that is. Uh, he's not an HR person. He's not a recruiter. So he doesn't have the insight into the business. He doesn't have the ability to make those kind of changes like we do. He doesn't have the ability to have that say so in the business process like we do. Okay. All right. So let's look through here. We're going to explore some kind of some questions and things you need to ask yourself. You might need to ask your business, you need to ask your team. If you're working with a group of recruiters or HR people, you want to ask your team and just dig into some of these things as well as some advice, just kind of sprinkled through. And after we get through this section, we're going to dig into some of those case studies again, just looking at some companies, how they approach the topic, what they think is valuable, those kind of things. So there's some really good, some really good nuggets in here. So when we think about why people don't prioritize this, this idea of sourcing internally for, for talent. There are a couple things that I've heard, again, anecdotally from different recruiters and NHR leaders about why they think this doesn't work. So first to say, but, you know, we're going to upset the employees if they aren't chosen. You know, we'll open this up, we'll let them into the process, we'll give someone an opportunity to move into this, this slot, but if they're not chosen, then that's going to disengage the employer, upset them. Okay, but the flip side of that, if you think about it, if you don't even consider the person at all, that's also going to disengage them. We had a had a position open years ago that was incredibly difficult to fill. I had spent probably two months trying to find someone, and there was there was nobody that had the quality we were looking for. And the government was very strict with this. It was a government contract, so the government was very strict with their requirements. They would not flex at all, and I, I was beating my head against the wall on this thing. And finally, after all this work, I finally found someone, got them on board, brought them in, sent the email announcement to all our, our employees saying, hey, we've just hired this person to do this job. And I had an employee email me and say, hey, I did that at my last company. I would have loved to have done that. Why didn't you offer it to me? And he was very upset that he didn't get the chance to do it because it would have been a career step up for him to be able to do it for us. And I, since then, have kick myself every time I think about this topic because that was an opportunity to, again, use those internal resources to do something. Wouldn't have spent too much, two months sorting, uh, searching for this guy that we have, that we had to, to bring in. So one example of a kind of excuse or a reason not to do that. The other, the other reason is managers don't want us taking their talent. And I think this is the most critical one, the most difficult one to get past because when you think about it, the managers that you have in your organization, they have, again, they, they see that talent is theirs. I, when I think back about conversations that I have with managers, they, they think about the talent as something that they own, that they control, that they might loan out to the business if they felt the need or if it was worth their while, but they didn't see it as, I'm managing this resource on behalf of the business, and the business could redirect that resource if they needed to. They didn't see it that way. So managers don't want you taking their talent away. They don't want you taking them, taking them, and opening those slots up on their team. But again, at the same time, we're, we're missing out on those chances for those people to grow and be better at what they're doing. I want to talk about Hootsuite in a minute. I'll explain how people do temporary assignments within the organization. And by doing those temporary assignments, they become more valuable in the roles that they're in. And there's, there's value there to be had. So even if it's not a permanent assignment, or even just a part-time thing or a temporary assignment, there's value there, and we can get the managers on board if we have the right approach. One of the other ones that we hear pretty often around, usually around succession and growing from within, is that our workforce won't be diverse enough. And we think about, you know, hey, if we're only hiring from in, within, then we're going to miss out on some of that diversity that's out there in the market. But I think that, again, I'm talking to an audience of recruiting professionals, that's on us to make sure at the front end that we're bringing in those diverse candidates so we can grow them up through the business. 
it shouldn't be that we only start thinking about diversity when we're thinking about succession and, and developing leaders and pulling them at those higher levels. We should be doing that through every single level of the organization. So I don't think that argument flies. I don't think it applies here and it doesn't really hold any weight because we need to be doing diversity recruiting and focusing on those things very early on in the process. I was talking to my friends earlier today, telling her I was about to do the webinar, and I said, I'm going to say something that, again, it might be for HR, for uh, recruiting people, it might not matter so much, but for HR people, it might scare them a little bit. And that's the fact that I think talent ability is more valuable than succession. When we think about it, you know, everybody hears that, hey, you need to have a succession plan, you need to be you know, doing those kind of things, but I think the talent ability is even, even more valuable because it takes it a step further. And I mentioned that earlier. Instead of it being just a top-down approach, hey, we plot you, we plot Katrina in this nine-box grid and see her performance versus her potential and see where we think she fits. Instead of doing that, we also have this third element of getting the individuals that are interested and letting them indicate where they want to go and to show what their aspirations are and what their interests are and leveraging that within the conversation so that we can make sure that the, our view of our talent and where it's going to go is holistic. It's not just our perception of it, but it also includes that that employee up kind of focus. And this, this reminds me of the idea that it's kind of in tandem with innovation. When we think about innovation, a lot of times the picture that comes to our head is somebody sitting in a room, you know, thinking really hard about something and trying to come up with the next the next great idea. But in reality, Innovation often happens at the very front lines of the work getting done because the people that are closest to the work know what works, know what doesn't. They figured out the workarounds, those innovative ways of getting things done. And there was an example of this that I heard a couple of years ago that this bar had a like, very mundane example, but a good one that kind of illustrates that front line uh, innovation. This bar, they had whenever their their bottles were their bottle bucket was full someone had to pick it up and carry it down these stairs down to the basement to to get the, the uh, bottles out of there so that they could you know have a safe clear space behind the bar to work and they started kind of going to the management saying hey you know what this is a problem we're having to pull people off shift in the middle of it to carry these things down there it's not safe it's dark it's dangerous it's heavy um, you know, if we had a better way to do this, we could serve our customers better. We could make sure that we were safer. We could uh, make sure that we were more productive because we're not taking time away from our shift to go and do these things. So they actually installed a little chute at the back of the bar to just drop up the bottles straight down into the basement instead of having someone carry this this big thing down the stairs and risk, you know, all that kind of fun stuff. And again, just an example of how something. This innovation that wasn't just for the sake of making the employee's job easier, but for the sake of improving customer service, possibly improving revenue, and all those kind of aspects. And just it reminds me again, going back to the talent ability idea, that so much of this is driven by those people at the very front lines and what they need and what we can help them by enabling their success versus standing in the way of it. Um, I think it's really important kind of differentiator to, to think about. One of the first things we need to do to really do this well, to really think about talent mobility and make it a part of what we're doing every day is to take stock of what we have. I've seen, I work and do a lot of work with HR technology vendors and one of the interesting aspects I've seen kind of pop up is this ability, or this kind of sub-genre of solutions that focus on how just collecting information about the skills and abilities of everybody, the competencies of everybody in your workforce, so that you can take stock of where you are. And there, there are solutions coming out for that, but that's not necessary just to be able to figure out who's good at what things. We can do that without the solutions, and um, we can get some idea of those things. But you can take stock of who you have, what they're good at, and what they can do. And that could be ad hoc, hey, something comes up and we need to do that now. It could be on a more holistic, strategic level, starting to do that regularly, maybe as part of your performance process or something else, and really understanding who can do what. Okay, you need to think about who can grow into a, a role. We need to think about who could flex, who could take it on if they had some additional, some additional support. One of the things that I had to think about, again, going back to my story a minute ago about that position that I recruited for for two months, think about the toughest fills, the things that you, every time the position comes open, 
you you know start sobbing because you know it's going to consume your life for the immediate future. Think about those things. Are there ways that your internal talent could help to bridge the gap to, to make that leap where it's not as challenging for you to recruit those things or it's not required that you go out there and spend the next month or two months trying to find those people. Instead, you can start bringing people up from inside the organization to really help support um, those types of fields. A couple of things that are required for success, I believe, and again, this is based on working as an HR leader, working as a recruiter, helping companies now that are that are trying to make culture process changes, things like that. The first thing up is the culture, the way that we see talent. I mentioned it earlier, seeing people as appreciating valuable assets versus seeing them as this static thing that doesn't get any better. The example that I always give is, do you have that when you're looking at a resume, if you, you've, you know that person that has one year of experience 20 times, you know, they've never grown, they've never developed, they've never, they can't do anything better or smarter than they did for the last 19 years, they have that one year of experience 20 times, or do you have that person with 20 years of progressive experience where they're growing, developing, becoming more valuable every single day because they are driving their development, they are interested in growing, they are trying to focus on those things. And I think the culture shift there is making sure that we're valuing growth and development over seniority, making sure those things are more important because I don't know about you, but I, for me and a lot of the companies I work for, hey, I've been here for 10 years, this is how we do things. Is carries more weight than someone saying, you know what, I've taught myself how to do this, I'm, I'm now you know, pretty, pretty much an expert at it, I have a good handle on it, and this is the right way to go. That, hey, this is the way we've always done it, usually carries more weight, unfortunately, because it's just a culture thing. I think it's up to us to help shift those kind of things, shift that thinking to drive that in the right direction. And the second one up is process. Obviously, I had a hole in my processes earlier when I talked about not being able to find that, that position and ultimately skipping over that internal person that could have been very well suited for that position. So being able to think through your processes when you're recruiting or when you have a position open up and, and really considering how you can start looping in those internal resources and looking for people inside the organization. How can you help people inside the organization grow and develop and mature in ways that can add value to the business. Thinking about those process aspects are going to be really key and critical for success there. And the last piece, again, it ties, it ties into that culture piece sort of, but I think just the maturity of the managers that you have working for you is going to matter a lot. A lot of managers, if you ask them if they'd be willing to lose their best person if they stayed within the company, they probably would say no. And I, I'll butcher the, the numbers, I can't remember exactly how it went, but basically there was a study done a couple years ago that said, would you rather have $50,000 and all of your friends make $25,000 or would you rather make $100,000 and all of your friends make $200,000? Well, when you think logically, like, oh, I would rather have a hundred because make, I'd, make, I'd be better off. But people picked the other option. They'd, they'd rather have less money as long as they were making more than their peers. And I think that, that ties in there. The managers, as long as they have the better talent than their peers, they feel like they're doing better. They feel like that is their, their thing. And again, we're about to get to the case studies, and I'll point out how Chipotle does a really good job of making managers development coaches for their people instead of just, you know, managers keeping their thumb on their talent, making sure that they hold them back, making sure that they keep them under their reign because that's not valuable long term. Okay. And we've already talked about this a little bit. When we roll the dice, we think about only hiring outside. The value there or the, the problem there is that we demotify <laughs> demotify, I just made a word. We demotivate those internal people who are qualified, who are interested, who are already on board. They know our culture. They know the way we do things. They know what's important. They've listened to all those, you know, executive rah-rah sessions and they know what's, what's important to our senior leaders. They understand those things and yet we're going around them, we're discarding them, we're whatever word you want to use, we're avoiding using those resources and going outside and hiring. And again, I point, I'm kind of stepping on toes, but I'm completely and totally guilty of doing this myself in the past. And now every time I'm helping someone recruit a position, the first thing that I ask is who do we have internally that can do this? 
sometimes there's someone, sometimes there's not, and sometimes there's no way to make that work, but that's the first thing we always ask. We try to assess that internal talent inventory to figure out who's going to fit that because it's incredibly valuable. And again, you'd rather ask them and them not be interested or not be able to make it work than to ignore them completely, then become demotivated and ultimately leave because you didn't seize that opportunity to, uh, to leverage that talent. So when I think about the value that recruiters bring to this, I think that we have the ability to do things that, again, even thinking about HR, thinking about other parts of the business, they're not as well suited for this. I think recruiters are the best for this idea of talent ability and really making it take hold because they are doing the recruiting. They understand the types of types of talent and competencies that the organization needs and makes makes use of, what are the hardest things to find, those kind of things sometimes are not on the radar of the other parts of the business. They don't understand the difficulty of hiring you know, a senior developer versus hiring um, you know, a controller. They don't understand how those things, they're not one-to-one -one in terms of how valuable those positions are to the business and they're not one-to-one -one in terms of how difficult they are to hire for either. And because recruiters have that unique insight, I think they're the best suited to really weigh in on this sort of approach, the culture change, the process change, and to influence that maturity of the business that I was just talking about in the previous slide. Those things all give us opportunities to really do those things well. And I think re recruiters have an opportunity that nobody else can quite pull off in the organization. One of the pro tips <laughs> on culture. You know, we talked about this a couple times because I'm, I'm such a culture junkie. I think it's incredibly valuable when we weigh the decisions that we're making in terms of the culture. The, the key thing here is to remove the stigma from people for indicating interest in other jobs. If, if you know, keep picking on Katrina, but if she says, you know what, I'm doing this job, but one day I want to be the senior director of um, Chicken Nuggets, some managers are going to see that as, you know what, hey, that's two steps above me. That's that's threatening. That's that scares me a little bit. Or hey, that's my job. And so they they start to push back. They start to sabotage that. And they start to do things, whether consciously or, or unconsciously, to drive that employee out to make the experience less pleasant for them. And I think that the more we can remove that stigma from those employees, indicating their interest in the roles, the better we're going to see these results. You know, if we if it's such an employee-generated process, like I've talked about a couple times, if it's so heavily dependent on them really powering it, we cannot, every time they say they're interested in something, we cannot push back or give them a reason that's not going to work or, or fight them over it because that's going to kill any interest they have in doing that. The companies that are the best that we're going to touch on in just a second that I've referred to like 40 times in the last hour, those companies are actually really good at changing their culture to focus on encouraging people to say those things, not not trying to limit them or hold them back. I guess the only uh, qualifier on that is if it's your first week on the job, shut up and get to work. It's not necessarily time to start telling you what other job you want to do. Um, you had that chance to interview when we asked you that, that stupid uh, where do you want to be in five years question. All right. So let's look at some stories. A couple companies that are doing this well. And again, it's kind of a, a wide variety. We'll look at um, what they're doing, some of their some of their results, and, and some other things. So it's just a lot of fun again to get some stories and wrap this wrap it around this topic we're talking about because it makes it clear, crystallizes in your mind, and hopefully it'll give you some ideas for how you can put this into practice beyond just some of the specifics we talked about in terms of process and other things. But it'll give you some real meaty ideas for how to put this into play. So again, every single one of these, I don't expect you to go through and copy what they're doing. Probably not a good idea. But if you get one or two ideas from the next few companies we talk about, just write it down. Go back, figure out how that might figure into your, your overall talent ability practices and, and give it a shot. I'm of the mind that HR talent recruiting leaders always need to be testing something. We need to be experimenting with something all the time. You think about marketing, you know what marketing right now is running some A-B test on something that we have no clue what it is. But when they're done with the A-B test, they'll be able to tell us which thing is better because it has proven results. And I think we need to get better at piloting and testing and experimenting in our talent practices because it will add value. 
So again, just uh, keep that in mind if you're going through these. Find a couple of practices you think are interesting or particularly aligned with your business and how you do things. See if there's a way you can incorporate some of those. So the first step is K-Post. They have this uh, they have this practice called tours of duty, and they are very clear about asking employees what do they see as their own career growth path. Where do you see yourselves growing? And this is kind of a unique example because I'm going to talk about people leaving the business in some cases, but they're also very mature about that. So one of the things that they realized was they were losing some of their some of their really high performers, people they thought were going to be stars, just a couple of years into their tenure there. And they started kind of digging into it and they realized, you know what, these people are leaving and they're going to start their own companies. They're starting these, their own uh, entrepreneurial ventures, they're being successful. So they kind of rebranded to say, we are the place where these great entrepreneurs come to start their businesses. They start their careers, they launch their careers from us. And so they now draw in those people that say, hey, you know what, I want to be an entrepreneur, but I'm a couple years off from that. I think I'm a high performer. I have a lot to offer. I have a lot to learn. And so they go in and they join this company. They can contribute mightily for a period of time, and then they move on with the encouragement of the business, if that's the direction they want to go, into some entrepreneurial thing. Again, that's a very extreme kind of idea in terms of the talent ability because there might not be any value to the business once they're gone. They might not come back, but you know what? They're going to talk about the business well. They're going to refer to them. They're going to be part of the alumni network, all those kind of good things. But going back to their actual practices inside of the business, you know, let's talk about before they leave. They say, this conversation we have around our careers for our people, it's a living thing. It's not, uh, you tell me one time the one thing you want to be, and that is set in stone forever. And that's my that was my concern all those years ago that I would say I want to be a you know I want to be a senior technical recruiter or I want to be a compensation specialist or I want to be whatever I was afraid that was going to pigeonhole me forever and thankfully again they understand that that can be kind of scary for people they say this is evolving all the time you might do something a new project and you realize this is the direction you wanted to go just like uh, finding your passions is not always about sitting back and just wondering hmm, what am I excited about what am I passionate about and using that to drive your passions because usually that doesn't work usually you find your passions by doing work and finding out what you do and don't like to do I know for me that's that guided my career for the first few years like wow that was terrible I never want to do a job like that again and ooh, this is neat I want to find a job where I can do more of that thing so giving people that opportunity and then one of the other things people said, some, an actual participant in the program said, this is not just a desk and a paycheck, it's a commitment to getting me where I want my career to go. And that, that it could be that career inside the company or even beyond it, but giving people that, that value and that opportunity to come work there, they're getting higher quality talent because they show themselves as that launching point for a future career in the industry. So I think it's a really great example. Next up, the company, World Bank Group, when I read this case study about the company a couple years ago, it was actually the thing that got me the most excited that spurred my initial interest in this idea of talent ability. So World Bank Group had a hiring freeze. If you follow the, comp the uh, nonprofit organization at all over the last couple of years, they've had some challenges. They've had some trouble um, in terms of the business. And so they were under this hiring freeze and said, hey, until we get this sorted out, no one's hiring anybody. Well, shortly after, like every business that goes into a hiring freeze, people started to say, hey, wait a minute, I still have things that need done. So their internal L&D team said, we'll create this talent marketplace so that people can bid on projects, you can select them, you can, they can join your team temporarily, and you get the value of that person inside the organization. We don't have to hire anyone. And that person gets a development opportunity, an experiential learning opportunity that might not be available in their current day-to-day -day job. Really neat idea. Again, I called it their eBay for talent earlier because that's the first thing I've thought of when it came to me. And what I liked most about it in terms of their key takeaways, the company said that the big shift for us was when we started seeing our staff as a corporate citizen instead of a, pri a proprietary resource that only had allegiance to their business unit, or to their manager, or to their their line, you know, unit, whatever they were in. They said this person is a re is a member of the organization 
holistically. Right now, they're mainly dedicated to this manager and that project, but really thinking, you know, again, go back to that gig economy sort of mindset, that's the bigger picture of this this kind of stuff and how people are seeing their talent and seeing it as a resource to be shared and used in the organization in a variety of flexible ways, some of them very granular. Hey, we need your, pro your help on this project for two weeks because this one part of the project is super critical and you are the best person in the organization to handle it. Um, I've had to use people like that in the past and had to approach them for that and you know what? People are usually excited about that, especially if you can get their uh, their daily workload reduced a little bit, so they're not trying to do two jobs at once. But people like to be known as the go-to person, the expert for something, and this gave them a chance to do that at scale within World Bank Group across the organization, global global nonprofit firm. Um, just a really cool story. Okay, Hootsuite. I can't remember. About a month ago, I think the CEO actually wrote an article, shared it on LinkedIn talking about the program because he was so proud of it. And one of the comments in it was that I thought was interesting for him, or in the article, he said, it's not about leveling up. You know, it's not just about moving you from an engineer one to an engineer two. You know, that's, that's thinking too small. It's about expanding you into new skills and new territory. So it's about taking an engineer and giving them some marketing background or giving them something else. I don't know, engineers and marketing necessarily, but giving them some exposure and opportunity to plug into another area of the business. So they're, they kind of modeled their program sort of after Google stretch program. They create these stretch assignments. It's a 90 day period and for one day each week they go and they work for another manager supporting them and their team and their projects in their own unique capacity. This does require a couple things. Again, going to go into that culture, that process, the, the maturity piece. The managers have to agree to reduce their job duties. So if I'm loaning you out, I have to understand that I'm going to get 20% less from you because you're going to be gone one day a week for 90 days. But the more important piece, I think, is that written understanding from both managers. If I'm loaning you out, here's the things I expect you to learn and bring back to me to bring back to me, my team, our part of the business so that we're better. This isn't just a one-way street value, value for the employee, but there's value for everyone involved. Again, on the other side of that, if you're getting the employee loaned out to you and you are using them, you have to create a learning plan. These are the things that you have to learn. These are the things that you're going to do. These are the tasks that are going to add value, and this is the expected outcomes that I have for you. And because they have that bi-directional kind of look at it, they're getting all these things captured and again, the organization gets a lot of value out of it. One of the stories that he told about one of the employees in the article was they, they stretched out, they did this work in this area and at the end of the 90 days, they were going to go back to their regular work. They weren't going to stay in the new assignment and make it permanent, um, but that is an option. But they came back to their, their, their regular role because, again, as we know, sometimes the grass is greener on the other side. Sometimes you go and you stretch and you're like, wow, this looks different from the outside. I suddenly realized I don't want any part of being, you know, supporting the sales organization or supporting the, the technical support team. I don't really want to do that long term. The value that I was able to, to add during my time there was good during the stretch assignment, but I want to go back to whatever I was doing and find another stretch assignment later. So it's just a good example that whatever you're doing doesn't have to be permanent. I think that's the big the big key there. It's not a you're putting them there and they're locked in forever and then they either love it and they're great or they hate it and they leave. It could be this temporary kind of thing to allow a lot of value for the organization. A couple of my friends used to work for a company called Bechtel. If you're not in the, you might have never heard heard of them. They're big in the government contracting world where I kind of worked for many years. But one of their key practices was they would find people in their t in their organization that were good at what they did, didn't matter what field they were in, good at what they did, and they moved them around every couple of years as a development strategy with the goal of having them contribute to the business for a long time. Their thinking was, you know what, if you are excellent at doing this technical thing and you have an interest in growing and developing yourself, we will find a place for you even if it doesn't, isn't in line with what you do. For example, the HR manager at the Huntsville office here for several years, she's not here anymore, but she was actually a chemical engineer by training. She'd been a chemical engineer, she had done other things, and she just became an HR manager and was really great at having conversations with her technical employees, interfacing, relating with them because of her background. And just a, just a neat example of being able to do that. And it was funny because a friend of mine actually worked for her, and I said, is it weird knowing that you have more HR experience than she does? And he said, 
you know, on some level it is. It's weird. But on the other hand, she is one of the best leaders I've ever worked for, and the, she still teaches me things every day. And so, again, just an example that um, cross that cross training, that flex across company lines, functional lines, hierarchical lines, is a valuable thing. All right, moving on. Chipotle. One of my now I'm getting hungry for some lunch. Um, so Chipotle, if you're not familiar, they're a quick service Mexican restaurant. Um, they, when I heard their talent director talk a couple years ago, I was blown away. So they. At the time that he was talking, they had just finished this program, they had come out of it, they said before they started it, they had more than 50% store manager turnover. And that's pretty high even for um, food service because these are managers, they're not just the, the line level employees. So after they finished changing some of the processes, some of their approach, their, their culture and things like that, the turnover for their salary managers dropped to just 35% and their turnover for the hourly managers dropped to from 111 down to 47 percent, and a lot of numbers. But just think about how big of a change that is, and being able to pull those things down to something that that is sustainable. And again, those people are adding value to the organization every day that they don't leave. So it's a good thing. One of the ways they did this is by changing the rules so that managers actually have to be hired from within the team ranks. They didn't suddenly add a new assessment for hiring managers. They didn't say, okay, well now we're only going to hire college grads. They said, we don't care what your background is. You've got to work here as an associate before you can be considered for a manager position. And when they stop hiring external manager candidates, that's when the turnover dropped. Really neat, really neat look there. One of the things they do as well is they give a $10,000 development bonus to managers for developing other managers. So if, if Matt works for me and I train Matt and I grow him up as a person and I teach him to lead others and you know he understands the business and I grow him up and he takes a manager position elsewhere, I get a $10,000 bonus for that because I grew him up. And again, you think about the value of a manager in a food service sort of capacity. If they're a good one and they're going to stick around, that $10,000 is well worth it to pay someone to grow someone in that kind of capacity. Really cool. And in terms of volume, this, this, this is a little dated. I need to touch base with them to find out the updated stats, but they paid more than a million dollars in those those bonuses in 2010 alone. So just a good idea of how often that's happening across all their stores is really, really, again, just a cool way to do it. I actually heard one of the guys, uh, the man that was talking when I heard him speak, he said that they have a manager who, who doubles his pay every year by doing this. He finds several people at different stores and that's his way of adding value. Like his second job is basically developing them into those people and new managers. And he keeps finding that talent and bringing them up. And they said they don't they were trying to understand how he found such good people in all the, the workers that were there. Because again, Chipotle is no different from any other business. Every single worker can't be great. But he did a really good job of going through and finding those those gems and growing them up and polishing them and developing them and helping them lead. It's a really cool story. All right, we have just one or two more. U.S. Security Associates, their story was really neat because their average tenure for their senior managers is 10 years with that company. And the, the employee that I kind of pulled out for that case study that I'd written was, had just moved to VP role and he began as, you know, 20 years ago, moved up through all these positions. That's an anecdotal example, but the company as a whole has a culture that focuses really heavily on bringing people up within the organization. And again, the, the delicate balance there, because I mentioned this earlier, I don't want to contradict myself, the delicate balance is making sure that tenure is not more important than growth and development. And you can see here through this manager's uh, kind of career path, they went from a training manager, operations, branch, district, VP. So being able to grow through these roles, it wasn't just a, hey, they've been there for 20 years, so let's promote them into something else. No, they, they've earned their way through that. They've developed and grown. They're more valuable today than they were last year and 20 years ago for sure, having that kind of mindset. And then Tata, I talked about them a little bit earlier. The thing that really gets me, that really just surprised me when I, every time I read it, is that the CEO, the CTO, and the CFO the three most critical roles in the organization all started with the company as trainees. They came as people at the very bottom level 
of the organization and they grew to those those sort of positions. And I think the thing that they do differently is they encourage their people to share their career aspirations. They're, they want them to put that information out there and share that regularly so they can make sure they're accommodating that, finding them places to go. And Tata's a massive organization, very large, but their their way of doing that is is definitely valuable for them for sure. Okay, uh, just about to the Q&A in case there are any questions, but uh, just a couple of takeaways. Seek first thine own talent, um, very biblical. Uh, uh, coach your managers, find or collect data to support your approach. If you can find data that says, hey, you know what, these internal people we put in this position end up being successful, they have more, they have, uh, you know, lower turnover or they have um, higher performance or something like that. They're, they're better in some way. Being able to prove that out, that'll add some value to your to your business case for going in this, this direction. I definitely want you to just go forth and conquer. Take these things you've learned today and go out and be great. So if there's any questions, I know I'm close, Katrina, but welcome to for anybody to throw a question out there, I'd be had, happy to answer if there's anything. Yeah, so I have a specific question from Naomi. Thank you so much for posting, posing it. Uh, she said, having worked in both large and small companies, I see how RollPoint would have found that large companies are more likely to fill from within. She says, you know, a small company often does not have many options for other positions without the employee obtaining significant retraining. How might a small company overcome that challenge when they don't have positions that can be moved to without training? The small companies have a couple problems with that. I tried to give the good example of, of Tina earlier moving, but as you mentioned, she had pretty significant retraining. She went and got her some uh, some education and program management and other things to move her to that role to flex. But for smaller companies, I think that's where the idea of a temporary sort of assignment makes much more sense. And again, it, it requires a lot of agreement from all the parties involved, and it can't be a full-time position, and it can't be a, a permanent role. But if we can get them over there for even, you know, four hours a week or for six hours a week, and being able to contribute and support another area of the business, that is going to add value. That person is going to be very, very thrilled with that because again, most small companies don't take the time and the effort to try to support their employees in that kind of capacity it's just it's too difficult there's too many too many um, issues and there aren't enough open positions and ability to do that but that's the way that I would do is really focus on that let's find a way to develop a short-term assignment for this person hey they'll be our guinea pig for the new pilot program and just give them an opportunity to kind of flex that but make it very clear what the outcomes are it can't just be a fun thing for them it needs to be you're gonna bring these things back that make you more valuable than you are today this by blending these experiences and everything else. I think it's the way to go. Absolutely, and we have time for one more. Um, how do you train hiring managers to be okay with talent mobility so you don't become the most hated person in the company? <laughs> because oh, we already goodness. know, right, there's some, some dissension between the two. So how do you kind of resolve yeah. that when you're talking talent? So the way that I've done that in the past is, is number one, there's not a quick and easy answer for that one, so I won't try to pretend that there is one. Just going talking quickly for, before we finish up. But the way I've done that in the past is I've actually had managers that I've helped to find those people internally in the organization to bring them on their teams. And when I do that, I always do it with kind of a wink, like you know, if I ever come for one of your people, you know, this could happen to you. I could bring someone. Uh, I'm bringing someone to you from somewhere else in the company now, but I could come to you one day and ask you for one of your people, and ultimately it's not your choice, it's theirs, and I just want you to be aware of that, and usually it's like a laugh, you know, slap on the back kind of thing, but I mean, that that has to be kind of the attitude that, that you have. If you have managers in your organization that you can have those frank conversations with, I've always had pretty good relations with my hiring managers, even when we're, we're stressed and we're, you know, behind on deadlines and we're, we're we're jamming it, trying to get the positions filled and stuff. I still had good rapport with them because I could I could talk to them openly about what was going, on and they could talk to me as well. So that's the way I would do it: is just really open conversations about things like that. And say, you know what, the alternative. Let's consider the the most the far opposite alternative. We never ever ever look internally for anybody. Well, again, you run into those problems where you you skip over that, that person that could have been perfect for it, that would have saved you. 
the sourcing costs, the time, the the posting, all the other the, the other costs that are associated with that, then that person actually turns over because they got upset. You didn't even consider them for the position. They they end up leaving, so you lose that high performer because you were trying to hold them so tightly. I I definitely agree. That idea of treating people like they're corporate citizens versus just treating them like they are, you know, assets of that one manager is a is a culture change and that's why I, I try to press heavily on that during the discussion today because I think that is really a critical piece that doesn't get a lot of attention when people talk about how to put these things into practice because it really is a different kind of approach. Absolutely. All right. Well that's our time. Thank you so much, Ben. That was really informative. I would love those case studies. I didn't know that Chipotle was paying out a million bucks just to get great people. Um, yes, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, so, let me scroll. Oh, yeah. So, yeah, I'm actually going to put together kind of a summarized version of the case studies. So, if anyone wants it, you're welcome to email me. Um, hit me up on Twitter at MenuBanks. I'd be glad to get you a copy of those. And, um, Katrina, I will definitely get you your own very personalized copy of that as well. I was just about to say that. You have to send <laughs> one for me. Um, and for anyone else who's still on the line, we will make sure that you also get a copy of this recording within 48 hours and a copy of the slides. Again, Ben, thank you so much. Really appreciate it. Um, and yeah, that's our webinar for the day. Everybody have a great one and go out and vote.